Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer time. Uh, we are on Facebook Live and we're also on uh, Zoom. So welcome. So if you see me flicking my head between two screens again, apologies, that's just why. Um, tonight we're going to be continuing to look at John chapter 14. Uh, just going into some more from verse 15 onwards. But before we uh, start that, let's just take some time and let's pray together. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this day. Uh, Lord, it's been a real strange day for us within our little country with, with rain and hailstones and sunshine now coming down. Uh, but Lord, we know that no matter what the weather's doing, that you're with us uh, and that you are, are constantly by our side. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Um, Lord, just at this time, again, we ask you to continue to be with us and help us. Uh, be with us in church, be with us in home, be with us wherever we are, however we're trying to work or study or be retired, or whatever's going on in our lives, Lord. Just we ask for your hand upon us, your hand of safety, your hand of blessing, um, and Lord, your hand of, of provision. We just think of so much that's going on around this world at this time, and we think about India uh, and what's, how the people are suffering. So we thank you, Lord, that we are blessed here within our own country. As we come to look at your word tonight, Father, just still and settle our hearts, we pray. Help us to be able to understand, to be able to hear, to be challenged, to be brought closer to you through your word. That and everything, Lord, we give you glory. So, Father, we thank you now and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're in John chapter 14 tonight, and we're going to be starting at verse 15. So let me read a few of those verses to you now. And then we'll start and we'll look at it. So I'm going to read. It's actually, I've got two versions in front of me tonight for a deliberate reason. Um, I'm going to read from the NIV at this stage. So let me read to you just some of the opening verses. If you love, this is Jesus talking, speaking, by the way. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But I know you, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me any more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also live. On that day you will realise that I am the Father, that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and they will and, he, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Let's pause there. Um, if you cast your mind back, if you know John 14, Jesus has just finished the very well-known passage about in my Father's house or many rooms or many mansions, whatever way you want to translate it. Um, and how he says that I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he keeps on talking to his disciples. And this is a very personal um, time for him. Normally before whenever Jesus has been speaking, uh, oh, they're surrounded by lots of different people. So it's not just the disciples that you're there. And even though Jesus at times appears to address the disciples directly, there's always people in the background listening. There's always others who you know, can hear what's being said and it's, it's speaking to them as well. Whereas now this is just the disciples. So it's, it, it's important. Um, it's solid teaching, you might say, um, what, what Jesus is talking about. So it, it, it puts more of an emphasis on it for us as we look at it. So Jesus starts off and verse 15 is a very short verse. Um, it only has a couple of words in it. It says, if you love me, keep my commands 
some translations put it, um, if you love me, obey my commandments. There's a difference between obey and keep. Um, whenever you start to look at the language, um, more accurate translation of the language which is used here is keep my command. Um, when somebody says obey my commandments, it's a case of, you know, this is what I'm telling you, just do it. And there's, there's no sort of sense of this is the reason why I'm telling you or this is the reason why I want you to do it. Whereas whenever Jesus says, um, keep my commands or my commandments, it's more of a sense of you know what my teaching is. You know why I've taught you. You, you know why I've come. And I urge you then to follow my teachings and to keep my commands. That's, that's why it's, it's better if you're looking at that passage, you want to think about it translation to say, keep my commands. That's an idea we're going to be looking at on Sunday morning, actually, um, about love and commands and keeping and, and what it means. But in this passage here, Jesus very clearly says to his disciples, keep my commands. You know, you, you know what I've taught you. You know why I've taught you. That's why I said, um, you know where I've come from. And, and whenever Jesus is asked, well, you know, we don't, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. You know, and he spells it out very clearly to the disciples. There's no, um, there's no talking in parables. There's no talking in um, sort of examples. It, it's a very clear teaching. And he wants them to be clear. He wants this understood. Jesus is also concerned about his disciples. He's concerned about what they're about to witness. He's concerned what effect that will have on them. Um, how they will be frightened by it, how they will be um, dismayed by it, how they will feel that, to use the phrase that we would use, that the rug has been pulled from underneath their feet and everything has come crashing down around them. So he wants, them to, he wants to remind them that that's not the case and he wants to encourage them. So he says this to them, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Now that word, which is translated um, advocate, uh, and, and different translations use that same word. Um, NIV say advocate, New Living say advocate as well. Um, if you want to go to the word which is actually used, it is the word paraclete. And maybe you've heard that phrase before, where the Holy Spirit is referred to as the paraclete. Now paraclete, the understanding of that word is complex, uh, and what it actually says Um if you look at the, the word and the structure of the word and what, what it talks about, it can mean to come alongside. It can also mean a legal assistant. Um, and there's, there's lots of different ways of taking that word paraclete. And I suppose in a way, by looking at the meanings of that, it, it sort of helps us to start and understand what the Holy Spirit does for us. We know it's the Holy Spirit because Jesus says the spirit of truth um, at the end of that, um, and then in verse 17, you know, he is the Holy Spirit as well, who leads in the truth. You know, so Jesus is declaring it's the Holy Spirit, but he uses that phrase, first of all, paraclete. So the sort of sense that most scholars would agree that Jesus is using is, he, he said that the Holy Spirit is going to help you through teaching, through revealing and interpreting to you what I have taught you. And that, that's what Jesus is trying to get across to the disciples. Like, you're not going to be left hand dry. You're not going to have to try and work this out by yourself. I am giving you the Holy Spirit. Or I'm going to ask for the Holy Spirit for you. And the Holy Spirit is really going to help you in all of this. And to help you to remember, to help you to recall, to help you to understand in the days that come what I have said to you. Um, you know, and... Jesus as well, he says, I will ask the Father. So Jesus has already said that he has come from the Father himself and the Father has sent him. And now he's saying that he's going to ask the Father and the Father will give you this other help. So we start to see part of the structure of what we call the, the, the Trinity. Um, Trinity is not a phrase I've said before that's used by anywhere in the Bible. It's a phrase that we use as people to help us to understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's very clear that the Father is 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 just that. He is the figurehead. He is the head of um, the, the Trinity. 
and you've also got Son and Spirit, who are all also part of the Father, but separate, who all have separate, I suppose i put it one way, rules, if you want to think of it that way, if that helps you to, to sort of think about it. Um, the role of the, of, of the Father is in Creator, as in Wise One, as in the one who never changes, who knows everything. The role of the Son is the one who comes to be our Saviour, who tells us about the Father's plan as well. And the role of the Holy Spirit to be the one who reminds us, who helps us, who is, re is really with us all the time. Uh, and that's what Jesus says here. Um, he says, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Um, you know, and, that, and that's, that's really important because the Spirit of truth, even that, again, that phrase talks about how you know, the Spirit's not going to lead us in the wrong direction. And and that's something really important for Jesus to get across because of what has happened in the past before with Satan. Satan is an angel created by God. Um, he he is another one of God's creations, but but he went his own way, and then who deceives and twists and turns things to suit himself, because he he craves power and he craves um, to be the top dog as such. You know. Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit is not that. The Holy Spirit is part of God. So we can trust the Spirit. We can trust the work of the Spirit. We can trust what he's doing in our lives. Uh, and that is so important. It's interesting what Jesus says and how the disciples pick up on it. It says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. So again, it's, it's that sense of invisible um, with us, but, but not able to see. And again, we struggle with that because we are people who we want to see evidence, we want to see things. But And again, the example is used so much um, about, well, look at the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind. And yet, yes, that's very true. And it's, that's easy for us to see. Holy Spirit is harder for us to see and harder for us to understand. But just think at times about that little inner voice that's inside you. The inner voice who, as you're reading God's words, it's like a penny drops and oh, now I understand. That little inner voice as well, which you know whenever you're going down the wrong path, reminds you that you're going down the wrong path. You're doing something you shouldn't be and, and pulls you back again. You know, and, and you're starting then to see the effects of the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in you. Because that, that's what comes across very clearly. Jesus is going to ask the Father for the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to dwell inside or live inside each and every one of us who trust Christ. So we are going to have the living spirit of God inside of us. Now that's exciting. It should also be scary because in one way it's that like God sees everything that I do. And I know that anyway, but with the Holy Spirit dwelling with me or living with me, he definitely sees everything I do. Um, and it's like, mm -mm, okay. Um, but it's not from that point of view of God standing over you going, ha ha, I saw that. And a rap of the knuckles. It's from the point of view of, I know you need me to help you, and I'm here to help you. Just, just trust me and let me help you. Um, and, and that's the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit. Jesus, okay, so Jesus says um, in verse seventeen, but you know him, for he lives in you, and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. Orphans, I will come to you. So again, it's it's that father figure of God who is always going to be with us um, who's not going to leave us isolated and alone but he will always be there with us it says before long the world will not see me anymore but you will see me the world won't see Jesus because he's going back to he's going he's going to die on the cross soon so there's going to be that break then the disciples will see him so you can tr you can translate this in one of two ways um, you could you could think of this as I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, and then I'm going to rise again, but everybody else is not going to see me, but you will see me. Um, we know those incidents where Jesus appears to his disciples and then to bigger crowds, but it's also that sense as well of Jesus returning to heaven and how the world will physically not see Jesus, but we will continue to see him because we see the effects of his teachings, the effect of his word and the effect that God has in this world. Um, as the kingdom of God grows. And he says to the disciples, because I live, you also will live. Again, maybe the disciples at that point scratch their heads, maybe you do as well, to say, 
because I live, you will also live. Um, what is Jesus trying to say? Well, it, it's eternal life. Because Jesus is going to die for our sins and be raised again, then he is in, in the heaven in a new body, um, which will not be corrupted, which will not waste away. And we have that to look forward to. We have that coming. That is our promise of what will happen in the future. You know, and that's what Revelation 21 is all about, a new heaven and a new earth and dwelling with God and God being with us and being our God and us being his people. So Jesus is talking about so many things here and it's no wonder that he says to them that he's sending them the, the Holy Spirit to help them because they're not going to understand everything that's going on. They're not going to be able to follow this through um, and to realise um, what Jesus is saying and, and the implications for them now and in the future. But Jesus says, on that day you will realise that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. You know, there's again, there's, there's implications there of what that means. Is it connected to the verse before, because I live, you also will live. So is it Jesus on that day? Is that our resurrection day? Yes, that could be part of it. What else could be part of it? Well, the day whenever the Holy Spirit comes, the day of Pentecost as we talk about it, um, as we read later on in the book of Acts, um, whenever the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples and they start to speak in different languages, dialects, tongues, whatever phrase you want to use for that, and how the people around them hear God's word in their own language and how they turn to him. You know, on that day you will realise um, that I am in the, my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Can you, can you imagine that day? You know, Jesus is, you know, talking about this. And can you imagine that day whenever the Holy Spirit came and what that meant to them and how they responded and reacted to that? I mean, I'm sure to a certain extent on that day, the disciples were um, frightened as well and a bit confused by what was going on. But at the same time amazed by what they heard coming out of their mouths and yet everybody else around them understood it. And I'm sure they understood it too. And they couldn't believe what was happening. Um, so Jesus is giving them so much information here uh, uh, and, and their heads I'm sure again to use that little phrase that we would use their, their, their minds are pickled by all of this and, and they find it hard to take it in but again the paraclete is coming who will help them with this and it's that sense as well that God's word to us at times can be overwhelming it can be so difficult to take it in what's God talking about but we don't have to try and understand it by ourselves. We have the Holy Spirit with us. And whenever we have trusted God, then he uses the Spirit to guide us through his word and to reveal to us or to show us what it means, what he's talking about, and to teach us so that we can grow. And that's an ongoing process. We never stop learning. We never stop understanding. And the Spirit will never stop Helping us to understand God's word. Um, you know, and, and, that, and that's the important thing. You know, God's word is so vast, so intricate, um, that we will always be learning. Uh, and there'll be always be something else that we haven't thought about and which God reveals to us. Jesus says in verse 21, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. You know, it's that sense that if we love Jesus, we will follow his teachings. And by following his teachings and by, and by declaring that, by showing by our actions, and we are showing that um, we love God, but that God also loves us and that Jesus loves us. We're not called to an empty faith. We're not called to a faith which is just words or just on a certain day of the week. We are called to a faith that is every day in every action. Um, that's what the book of James is all about. Some people like the book of James, some people don't. It's caused so much controversy over the years. But James is trying to teach that faith always should have actions that back it up or actions that show that faith is present. It's not about your works making you right. It's about faith that makes you right. It's about obeying, keeping those commandments, keeping that teaching, 
but then how that works through. And then how, by doing that, Jesus shows how much he loves us by, first of all, giving us the Spirit, and then by God adopting us into his family. There's so much packed into this little bit of the Bible. Um, Judas is not Judas Iscariot. So yeah, you've got to remind yourself that sometimes that there's still a Judas present in the room, but he's not the one who's betrayed Jesus. Um, so why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And that's a, I suppose, a very valid question. You know, whenever you're hearing what Jesus is saying, maybe the disciples say, but, but surely Jesus, you want everybody to know you and you want everyone to see you. So why are you only showing yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replies, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. So Jesus declaring, this is open to anybody who will follow my teachings. Anybody who will accept me as Saviour, as Messiah. But there's a, that recognition that not everybody will. And there's also that recognition that God is and Jesus is not forcing himself onto anybody. Um, that's really important, that God creates us with free will. Uh, that's the whole basis of, of why they're sinning in the first place, because Adam and Eve had the free will to choose to eat the fruit or not to eat the fruit, and they chose to eat it. Um, they chose to disobey God. And it's the same now. As much as you know, God wants us all to be with him, he will not force himself onto any single one of us. Following God is something we have to choose to do, something we have to want to do, something which, as we read our way through the Bible, is going to be a challenge, it's going to be difficult, and we will face opposition, but something that will bring great reward, because through that it says, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Imagine that, God making his home with us, God wanting us as part of his family. That's what this is all about. This is an amazing and a wonderful story. And because God wants us with us, yeah, we are blessed. Uh, and we know that, um, we know that blessing each and every day. Let's park it for there for this evening, folks. There's an awful lot in that about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does for us and getting our heads around that and understanding that. And also about what it means to have our faith um, shown out through works. So yeah, that's, um, we'll leave it there for tonight. And, and just take that away and think about that. And pray about that. And, and think about your, your own situation. Think about your own life and your own actions day by day. And think about where you know that you can show God and where maybe at times we... Um, try to exclude God because maybe we're embarrassed by things that we do or we don't want God to see that. And think about what it means to let God into every part of our lives and how that would transform our daily actions. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you just for the challenges that come with it, the encouragement that comes with it as well. Lord, help us each and every day to accept those challenges and to accept the teaching and just to see what it means to us. And Lord, help us to follow you. Now and always, Father, we thank you. In Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for watching along. I'm going to shut down Facebook now. And we're transferring over onto Zoom for our prayer time. Take care and God bless.